welcome to 21 This Week. I'm Susan Haltimus filling in for Casey Aiken. Coming up next, county bun budget finalized in a unique manner. Montgomery County is most diverse, and the Donald rolls on in his quest to rule the world. Joining us today is an esteemed panel of Montgomery County activists, former Democratic delegate Louise Simmons, Republican businesswoman Rose Lee, former Republican Assistant Secretary for Business Bill Askenazi, and former Democratic Majority Leader John Herson. Stay tuned for these topics and parting shots next on 21 This Week. <music> Wallet Hub asserts that diversity has made our country adaptable and helped thrive. This week, Wallet Hub named Gaithersburg the most diverse city in the United States, beating out LA and New York. Silver Spring came in fourth place with Germantown in fifth and Rockville 14th. For diversity, the website noticed, noted diversification is nothing to be feared. In fact, economic growth follows it. America would not enjoy such rivaled economic success if not for the ways of immigration that both changed the face of the nation and accelerated financial and social mobility. Bill, do these ratings surprise you? No, not at all. I mean, I, I sold Maryland when I was with the Ehrlich's administration for years internationally. We've got a lot of things cooking in Maryland, high demographics, educated people, etc. What did surprise me in that was that if you, if you take out the economic diversity, we're ranked in the bottom 10%. And economic diversity in that study is defined as where the folks work. We're not spread across different sectors. That scares me. We're very dependent on the federal government. Whoever the next president is, and we'll get to that, but downsizing could affect adversely and impact unemployment. Then where do we go? We don't have skilled workers who can easily translate those skills to other disciplines. Now, Luis, do you think this diversity indeed means accelerated financial and social mobility for all? At the end of the line, but I think initially we all know that there are formidable challenges in providing access to education, auxiliary services such as ESOL, training in other languages, nutrition, health care. You know, right here in Gaithersburg, in the elementary school, almost 80% of the children, as we know, are on free and reduced lunches. So initially, there's going to be huge demands on the county. We have to meet them, and uh, we'll talk about it with the budget. Yeah, that's true. Well, that's a great segue. Let's just go on to the budget then, okay? And this week, the council finalized a budget for next year with a final vote to be taken on May 26. The council raised the property tax by 8.7% which requires a unanimous vote of the council, and also increased the recordation tax. The council also took back some of the pay increases that had been negotiated by county executive legate for county unions, and most surprisingly, the council, working with the school board, got MCPS to take back some of their union increases, because in the past, MCPS has not participated in austerity measures. Now, John, this budget adds $90 million to the school system beyond the mandated uh, maintenance, uh, maintenance of effort minimum, which means the county must equal it in the following years and increase it a bit. It also added mon money for buses to Toby Town, a historically low-income black neighborhood in Potomac, added police officer and sheriff positions, and $4.5 million to fund a publicly financed election system. Is this a good budget? Well, well let's start uh, in the discussion about that, really where the bulk of this money is going, the increase in the budget, and that's to education. So that's, I think, a good thing. I mean, and look at three factors, I think, that, um, that underline that this is the right decision. One is Fairfax County just did the same thing. I mean, so you're talking about a much <coughs> different jurisdiction in Virginia, controlled by a different party, you know, it, it, it actually made a decision that was very similar to the one here in Montgomery County. Second factor, I think the county executive recommended this, this uh, initially, this, this increase. Although he um, did back off He a backed bit. off a little bit, but then, he in, then they went with this increase. So, I mean, it's not like the, the parties are not, you know, agreeing on this. And I think the third thing is really that you have 
you know, a unanimous decision of the county council. That's pretty hard to get. These are almost the, impossible. Almost impossible, but they managed to get a unanimous decision. My take on all of this is, and I, you know, I don't know the ins and outs of the budget, um, but I, my feeling on it is, is it's probably a good budget. Well, now, Rose, the diversity we earlier discussed was at the heart of this budget, just as John said, a system that's growing by almost 2,000 students a year. This is a budget in, you know, increases school construction, which we're told <coughs> is really needed, and addresses the achievement gap, which has been discussed a lot. It's in a system where many of the students speak little or no English. Is this a right approach to assist a school system that's you know, struggling with this ever-growing diverse student body? I think everybody agrees that we all like to support education, and I think the frustration among the voters out there that I'm hearing is um, not understanding why raising taxes is the first step. And there's so many other ways that people think haven't been done right. For example, people question why are developers not being made responsible to put more into building the schools when they're the ones building all these places that bring in more families. Um, and then there's the whole question about the state. Montgomery County is one-sixth of the state's population and we pay every dollar that we pay we only get 20 cents back. Why are we not going to the state to try to get more money for Talk our to schools? Governor Hogan I think is part of the answer. But that's that's part of the frustration is that the I think a lot of people feel like we don't see the efforts being made and doing this undermines the ability to make the claim you know, that the state <coughs> needs to provide let, let more. Me, let me support you on that comment for just a second. This county is changing demographically big time mm -hmm. and I think one of the things that happens and Lou would know this down in Annapolis is there's an assumption that oh Montgomery County can take care of itself that is no longer the case I mean we just can't keep raising taxes when we need some help from the state just like Baltimore City mm -hmm. gets just mm -hmm. like other jurisdictions get because of the changing demographics in this place. Let, let me just add one thing and, and this is something we've talked about in the past uh, the late Daniel Patrick Moynihan used to make that distinction between input and output. Mm -hmm. And it's not enough for input, you have to measure the results. And so many people find these achievement gaps, right. which have existed and persisted for almost 20 years in Montgomery County, in Baltimore City, across state, people want to see that the money is being well spent Correct. and they want results measured. They don't want, right. uh, you, know, you know, rigged results. They want to know how are we doing? Is fourth grade uh, educate? Is our fourth grade reading improving? Or is eighth grade math improving? Are kids able to think when they when they leave the high school and go to colleges? Yeah. Th yeah, these Bill, are things we're yeah, not measuring. Yeah, yeah, and you know, John mentioned that Fairfax increased theirs too. So this is an issue across no, the board. I totally agree with John. There's an institutional bias in Baltimore against Montgomery County. When I was yeah. with uh, now it's the Department of Commerce, but the right. state DBED, there was. Uh, that if a, if a county applied for a grant, there would be uh, a matching grant from the state, except for Montgomery County. Right. It was only 50 percent. Right. Right. Now, I, I think that what Lou is saying is absolutely right. You know, there's a whole thinking in the corporate world about metrics, you know, measuring things and making sure the outputs are equaling the inputs. You're you're right on. Well, and but, I think that but, exists. But, but, but one thing, but we, no, when really I first measured. when I first uh, moved here, and I know John. Ida Mae Garrett and and the yeah. and, and Helen Cosma, they all rest in peace, uh, and Lucy took Mark, care of the whole state. Well, but they took care of the whole state because at that point they were saying the same thing. You know, Montgomery County is the land of uh, yeah. you know milk sugar, and milk and honey. <coughs> but and this has persisted for forty years. The only difference is, as John is saying, as everybody's saying, the demographics have radically okay, changed. Okay, one quick question, yeah. Luis, <coughs> and then we have to move on, and that is. Are the voters going to penalize these people for voting for the increase in taxes? Well, in my opinion, I mean, again, maybe this is just them being an old curmudgeon, but I don't think that in the 8th Congressional District, maybe some of the people in the 6th might be a little bit more conservative, but I don't think that the county council is going to be penalized. I do think statewide, uh, which we saw in the last election, that, yeah. that there was a, a general malaise where people weren't happy in the state, but I don't think Montgomery okay, County... Okay, well, uh, I know we're going to talk about this more, but we have to take a short break and we're going to be right back for the fun. We have endured yet another week of excitement, or is it fear, in this year's presidential campaign. No matter where two people or more are gathered these days, there may be love, but there is invariably a conversation about Donald Trump, an entity unto himself. Now, panel, 
Here is a candidate filled with hate speech, and when confronted this week about his assault on Bimbo, said, excuse me, not I'm sorry. Here is a candidate who refuses to release his taxes, and when he last released taxes in 1981, he had paid no taxes, but is now demanding the tax records of all potential VP candidates. Here is a candidate who is a master of manipulating free media, but now when the media is beginning to do critical journalism regarding his candidacy, is crowned fall and threatens to, of course, sue. Here is a candidate who is on wife number three and has a record of serial infidelity, but attacks hits back at the presumed Democratic nominee by attacking her only husband regarding his past indiscretions. Here is a candidate who shoots from the hip and wants to arm South Korea while meeting with the North Korean dictator, attacks NATO, a strategic U.S. partner, and shoots off a tweet about hatred and terrorism mere hours after the crash of a plane this week without knowing any details. Here is a candidate who says that his um, hugely loved by everyone and wants to represent everyone but releases a list of 11 potential Supreme Court nominees who are all white, eight men and women, who all are far right of the center. Now, Bill, although Republican Governor Hogan has steadfastly refused to endorse Trump, uh, Trump Maryland overwhelmingly on the Republican side voted for Trump. How do you explain the presumed candidate of your party? Susan, is that all you have? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I could probably dig out if we had another half hour. Let me tell you, and this, seriously, every thoughtful American needs to be concerned about the future of our democracy, not just with Trump, uh, Trump but with Hillary Clinton as well. They're the two most le least liked candidates in the history of democracy. But let me say this. Why, then, has 10 million Americans already cast their ballots for Donald Trump, not just Republicans, but independents and Democrats as well in crossover primaries. There's something brewing here that's very serious. It's anti-establishment. Now, I'll tell you some solace. Trump finally is maturing as a candidate. He's surrounding himself with a lot of good people. I really believe that not just political people, but he's bringing in experienced defense people. He's bringing intelligent people from the uh, CIA and from other organizations internationally as well. This is becoming a mature candidate. I think that the vice presidential pick will be very telling for a lot of voters this year, much more than in past elections. Number two will matter a lot more than it did in, pa in the past. Yeah. Okay. Well, Rose, now according to polling, women across the spectrum have an intense dislike of Trump. As a Republican woman, do you think Trump can garner support someday among women in Maryland or across the country? I think, uh, like Bill said, I think he is starting to become more presidential. I think he's watching more what he says. He's surrounding himself with good people to help him navigate these waters. And I think over time, people will start to see his strengths. And I think one of the things that comes across is he's a problem solver. And the fact that he, when he started, people thought it was a joke. And now look at where he's come. I think that is, people are impressed by that. That is like the American dream to, despite the odds, despite everyone telling you, you can't do it, you can do it. And he's even said that if he doesn't win this, it would be a waste of time for him to have, to have done it. So he's totally focused and there's something admirable about the persistence. A, a business executive always surrounds himself with good people. That's what happens, and that's what he is, and that's what's going to happen. But does he listen? That's the question that I <clears> keep hearing. He's learning to. Now, Luis, Democrats have issues of their own um, during this campaign, but Trump has insulted or alienated interest groups across the country, not only women, but Jews, Latinos, disabled journalists, and the list grows almost daily. The electorate may be angry with the system, but is the, delu the disillusioned electorate angry and myopic enough to vote for what many call a maniac? I think the answer is yes. Uh, we don't know for sure. All of the recent polls, the New York Times CBS poll today, the Wall Street Journal, uh, the Fox News poll, which uh, Anderson Cooper was uh, touting just uh, last night on CNN, show Trump either even with her, slightly behind, and most importantly, in the critical swing states, it's very early, <coughs> Florida, Pennsylvania, and Ohio, running head to head and slightly ahead in Ohio. Now, it's way too early, but we as Democrats, in my opinion, have got to remember that there is also the white working class, which we have been losing in election after election. Uh, here in Maryland, we lost uh, many, many good legislators, Democrats in the last election. Uh, seats that were Democratic now became Republican. Trump is attracting white ethnic voters in huge numbers, and I believe Hillary Clinton and we as a Democratic Party 
have got to rediscover them and make sure we just don't call them angry, but say, why don't you feel that the system, uh, why do you feel the system has but, failed? But you? he can't win with just white angry men. No, no, it's, well, it's not, it's not just white angry men. I think we have to say that there are, despite, when you look at the actual polls, many women, for example, they're breaking for Hillary Clinton. But they don't like, you know, uh, it's unfortunate. This is a terrible election because no matter who wins, this country is going to be deeply, deeply divided. Imagine what happened when, when Obama won. There was a sense of hope in the country, even among Republicans who voted for him. There's not going to be any sense of hope in this country if Hillary wins or if Trump wins because people are so virulently divided about the two. So I don't, you know, even if Hillary wins and as Democrat I want to see her win, I'm not optimistic because I think this country is well, terribly divided. Well, John, I just want to ask you a question. Yeah. Someone described an editorial cartoon to me uh, a few months ago with four photos in it. Hillary Clinton on the left with the caption, first female president, then Bernie Sanders, first Jewish president, Ted Cruz, first Canadian president, and Donald Trump, last American president, and which uh, it's, uh, it is really a sad thought. Rachel Maddow of MSNBC recently stated that she's reading everything that she can find about failed nations. You served as the president of the National Conference of State Legislators from 2004 to 6, and in that, you had to, were able to interact with elected officials across the country. With that perspective in mind, is America on a precipice of potential downfall, as many believe, if Donald Trump were to become president? Here's what I will say, because I think we've entered a period of time when we're now going to start adjusting to the uh, national election as opposed to the primary. Mm -hmm. um, Donald Trump has tied up his nomination, and he's gotten a lot of good press out of that. Um, but I will tell you, I think you know a couple recent articles on the editorial page of the Washington Post, Eugene Robertson um, and Robert Kagan, Robert Kagan being a Republican operative from the Bush administrations, Eugene Robinson being, you know, basically, I think, a Democrat. I mean, the bottom line is both of them were sounding a real siren call about how dangerous Donald Trump is. I don't agree. I mean, I, I, I mean, I, I, I but I, I'm just telling you, okay. it's across the board in terms of people in the city of Washington who know how government works saying this guy is not qualified to be because president. They're, and because I think we actually have to start thinking because that we can't elect this guy. Because it would be a real big mistake. Because their interests are threatened. So of course they're going to say the sky is falling. Look, when you start appealing to fear and panic. But this is the it, question, it, that, Bill. Do you think he is qualified? He has a trigger response that is frightening to everyone in the way he shoots from the hip. His, his rhetoric is of concern. There's no question about it. To yeah, any and because of that, you can start a war overnight. He sneezes, the economy failed. Look, look, he sneezes, we go into war. There's war. One, one historical mm -hmm. um, uh, paradigm. Uh, give him hell, Harry Truman. When Harry Truman, if you look back at, the, if you look back at Harry, Harry Truman Tr was vice president. Harry okay? Tr he had been tested he knew a lot he got into politics. Before he got that. Before he got into politics, when he first ran for office, he was the person who was going to ruin everything and bring us to war and this and that. He was a senator from Missouri. But, but I mean, he had been elected. He had been elected. And the problem is right now, in 24-hour media, the rest of the world is watching this election. And I'll tell you, if you listen to the BBC or other international coverage of the news, they're really worried. He has ticked off so many people. I mean, I don't think that that think helps the Democratic true. cause. No, I think, no, I think no, actually but they're fine but, if we tick off but, the world. But, you, but, you but know, we should be very concerned yeah. about us. Yes, yes. And we need to really Agreed. evaluate this guy yes. and say whether or not he is qualified to be president. I am not convinced at all that he's Everybody qualified. Everybody well, should I, be fed. I agree. With, I agree six with John. Ago. But I would say that this narrative is a peculiarly Montgomery County narrative. And the problem is, is that when you go to places around this country, some of which are epitomized by Dundalk, Maryland, but mm -hmm. they're much bigger, and they're Pennsylvania, and they're Wisconsin, they're on the eastern shore, uh, they're in western Maryland, they're in Cumberland. <laughs> People have heard this for a long time. I mean, let's remember, Trump has been the object of millions and millions of dollars. I don't know the number, but it's a huge number of, of attack ads. People making these same points long before Kagan's op. 
And the fact is, people are voting for him. Now, it's admittedly, they're Republicans, but he did some attract some independents. But, but and I mean, the vitriol that comes out of his mouth, <coughs> that just, and, and that hasn't changed. And his wife and his daughter told him, <coughs> you need to be more presidential, and he hasn't. Look, look at Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton right now. Why are they slogging it out it, all that, the way through? Why is the Democratic Party bad. so divided? That's bad, but you know what? They're not calling people bimbos, and they don't poke fun of the disabled, and they're, you know. But the uh, fact that people are still voting for Trump, and a lot of them who are Republicans are not crazy, it, 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 it's evidence of a fundamental problem that, oh, it's, in other words, we can condemn Trump, yeah. and I do, and you, but that's not going to move that's us not toward understanding change. It. You are absolutely right. She, the only thing stop it between him and the presidency is Secretary one person, Clinton. Secretary Clinton. So this and she needs to change her yes. tune yes. to really appeal to that white I mean, working you can't class. Go, you can't group. say in a, in, a, in a glib way, uh, we're going to put all the coal miners out of work. No. no. And then, and, she and, paid and then, for it. And then expect mm -hmm. you're going to go there and they're going to embrace pay for you. It in the general but election. It's, it's those kinds of statements right. that w we have made. But, but Luis, and what a big does. Country out there. But, but mm. a, a moderate centrist. Larry Hogan hasn't endorsed him. And what I am hearing now is that the Republicans who are going to raise money that he needs are not going to raise for him. They're going to try to save Congress how, and the Senate. How could Larry Larry Hogan, in, in a very liberal state, yes. one of the most liberal states in the country, endorse Donald Trump? Politically, <laughs> don't you think that'll kill but him in the re-election? Uh, put that aside. Doesn't that say something that he does think? No, but I, no, I, I, in this state, this state is not an issue. Okay, it's yeah. not this. Hillary is something had like 35 points, I okay. think. Okay, anyway, so. um, we're gonna be back after a short break. Boy, <laughs> I could go on another half yeah. hour. <laughs> we'll be right yeah. back. Now it is. And now with parting shots, Luis. Uh, Senator Robert Zirkin, who is a progressive on judicial issues, is going to be leading a movement in Maryland over the next several years to reform criminal convictions so that individuals who have been convicted of certain kinds of crimes can get them expunged over several years if they show good conduct and demonstrate uh, that they've been rehabilitated. Uh, you'll see Maryland as a leader across the country in this area. Okay, Rose. I'm going to go a little international. Today um, was the day that a first woman president was inaugurated in Taiwan. And it was uh, the true experiment of democracy that has been unfolding. And a lot of people didn't like the way that turned out, but we all need to be watching this very closely. Okay, Bill. The governor of Alaska, for being intellectually honest and honest with the voters, he said he's going to raise taxes. Why? Because the oil revenues are plummeting in Alaska and other oil producing states. And he said that if I'm a one term governor, so be it. Okay, and John. Oh my God, I have more time than I thought I had. <laughs> um, so I actually want to. Um, <laughs> I have been a, a victor and a loser in elections. Um, and having done both, I want to congratulate all the people who ran in the primary, uh, but who did not win. Um, and, but I want to congratulate them for being there and going out and actually you know, putting themselves forward and trying to change the system. I mean, there's a lot of pain and anguish that goes through running for office, as we all know. Um, you know, both raising money and knocking on doors. But I think the fact that these people did that is, is really admirable. And I want to thank all of them for doing it. It's and really important. And everyone on this panel has been a loser. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, and John, I've been a winner, too. You, multiple. I just want to make sure and he's been a people too. know. John, I've been a I have won and I have lost, and I want to tell you that winning, winning is better. Winning is much better. <laughs> I've never I won, agree. so I don't know. Anyway, um, I, and I also personally want to extend my deepest sympathy to um, Gino Ren and his family. He is the president of McGeo, and his mother passed away this week. So, Gino, um, our sympathy is with you. And this was an amazing, amazing show, and it went by so fast. So until next time, follow 21 This Week on social media. We'll see you next time for Montgomery County's hardest-hitting political talk show, 21 This Week. I'm Susan Helfenis, and bye for now.